Hello everyone, I'm Randy Brown, and today I'm gonna to share with you five tips to help you build your own martial arts training center at home or close by. Let's get right into it. Number one, maximize our training. How do we do that? Schedule. Schedule. Schedule is crucial. This is one of the most important facets of training on our own. We don't have a group class to go to anymore, so we're responsible for ourselves getting out there and getting the job done. And this is how we do it. Without this, without setting a schedule, it turns into basically this scenario. I'll train this afternoon, this afternoon rolls around, I'll train tonight. Tonight rolls around, uh, tomorrow. Next thing we know, tomorrow turns into a month later. And then we try to go back and set a routine again. We last maybe one, two sessions and we fall right back into that habit. So setting a schedule can help keep us on track. And this is important from this little word that I've heard for the last 21 plus years of martial arts training. People tell you all the time that discipline, martial arts gives you discipline. Take your kids to martial arts for discipline. Adults that want discipline. Discipline comes from here. It starts here. Discipline is showing up every week for class. Showing up for our schedule. That's how we get discipline. From, we build it organically from within ourselves. So it becomes part and parcel with who we are. And that bleeds over into other aspects of our life. No one's going to stand there and preach to you about uh, be more disciplined and that's magically going to happen. This is how it happens. Set your schedule and stick to it. Another key word that we hear all the time with martial arts is respect. Respect comes into play in a lot of ways. Today for what we're talking about, respect comes into for solo training, respecting our time. The time that we set, showing ourselves the respect to show up and give ourselves that effort to help us mentally and physically stay in shape. However, some of us have built in training partners at home. So for those of us that have someone that we train and we went to class with, they're also a martial artist, then we want to respect them and respect their time. So together, we want to sit down and come up with a training schedule that works for both of us. And then we want to respect our partner enough to make that sure that we show up for that time. Training partners right now are at a premium. So we want to make sure we take good care of the ones that we have. Maybe make them a dinner or something once in a while. Show some appreciation somehow so they keep showing up and working with us because we need that. Now next on our list. Location. Location is also important. And some of us live in different places. So let's talk about the situation that you may find yourself in. Apartments. Let's start there. Because this is the most complicated. We live in an apartment. Space is restricted. We might have neighbors below us or above us so we can't be jumping or stomping making a lot of noise. We certainly can't hang any bags and equipment that we want to train with. So what do we do? Outdoors is our best friend. I lived in an apartment when I started training and I only had one training session a week with my teacher. The rest of the time I had to train on my own. And my primary place for training, my personal dojo if you will, was the top floor of a parking garage next door to my apartment. That was an excellent place to train because after five, it was usually empty and cleared out and rarely did I ever get disturbed. But other options that you can have are parks when they're open and beaches. Every Friday night, I used to drive to the beach about an hour away and I would spend two hours training on the beach when it was dark and people weren't around to bother me or that I wasn't in their way or freaking them out doing martial arts on the beach. It was also very calming and relaxing and I could sit 
and enjoy the uh, scenery and the smell and the waves after I was done. Not everyone lives at a beach, I get it, or near it, but do the best you can to find a place outdoors that's comfortable. And lately, with social distancing in effect, you don't have to worry about people walking up and getting in your face and saying, what are you doing? Because that does happen. At first, training outdoors, especially in public, can be very intimidating. Especially, it can, you can get feelings of anxiety or self-doubt, but that will go away. All you have to do is keep showing up. Now, if we live in a house and we have a different setup, now, do we have a yard? Do we have a garage? Do we have a basement? Those are all factors that come into play. We want to try to find a dedicated space that we can use for our training by itself. If other things go on in there once in a while, that's fine, but we want to make sure we go to the same place every time. That can help in our mind set us into a mental state that it's time to train. It's like similar to getting a uniform on. And that's another recommendation, just a small one. Change your clothes into your training outfit. Sounds trivial, but it makes a big difference in our own mind. Now, if you have a driveway that you can train in, that's great. If you have a backyard or a front yard, also great. Surfaces matter. You want something soft if you're doing any sort of groundwork. Or if you're doing striking, you can be a little more versatile, kicking, where you can work on hard surfaces, soft surfaces. If you have a basement or a garage available, then we can talk about equipment in a minute to get you set up on how to maximize that space and use it to the best ability that we can. If we do have a house and we don't have a lot of room, then we're gonna spend a bulk of our training outdoors, so we wanna keep that in mind, especially if we live in colder climates. As they say in Scandinavia, there's no bad weather, there's only bad gear. Let's talk about Equipment. Let's get into it. First, let's talk about strikers and kickers. What equipment do we need? Number one, best thing that you can invest in is a heavy bag. There are a lot of different types. Heavy bags come in small sizes, large sizes, etc. So let me give you a few tips about bags. If you can get your hands on one right now, because again, also at a premium, you want to pay attention to what kind of height you have available, if it's indoors. If it's indoors, we want to look at also the structure that we're going to attach this to. And remember that it's not just the dead weight of the bag that we have to consider, it's also the forces that are being applied to the bag when we're kicking and punching it and it starts swinging around. So I recommend if you only have a two by six construction that you do a cross beam of a doubled up two by sixes, for example, you can do what's called a bridge and you can attach your hanger into that. Two by eights, two by tens, little better off. But again, I like stuff that's a little beefier so I make sure that I'm not gonna tear the house down or ruin the structure. So personally, I would find if I have the exposed ceiling, I would attach like a four by six in between and lag your hanger from that. The height is going to be very important. And height dictates the size of the bag that we can get. If we have a short ceiling, we're going to be limited to half bags or even shorter perhaps. And that is gonna stop us from doing certain techniques, but we can still use it and get a benefit from it. So half bags, short bags, striking predominantly, knees, elbows, and mid-level kicks. Low-level kicks are out of the question unless we put a pulley system where we can raise and lower the bag when we're training. Personally, I think it's a pain in the butt and you won't use it, so I wouldn't bother building it. I would just make the best with the bag that you can. Now, when you measure, now when you measure for your bag, you want to keep something in mind. It's not just the height of the bag. 
It's also the chains coming up, plus the connectors, and the space underneath the bag, because the bag is gonna settle over time and sag. So we wanna give ourselves a good six inches be below the bag when we set it up, and make sure we account for the chains up above. If it doesn't have chains and it has straps, that can be a problem because it's harder to adjust. With a chain system, we can use bolt cutters and we can shorten the chains to allow us to get closer to the ceiling. If you're, outdoor, if you're outdoors, you could hang the bag from a tree or you can dig a hole in the ground, fill it with concrete and set up a four by six going up and a four by six going across, kind of like this. Something like that into the ground and then hang your bag off of that. If you do hang a bag outdoors, you want to look at what the material on the outside of the bag is. Vinyl might stand up a little better over time. You'll have to ask the manufacturer. If you're going to use leather, then you want to pick up some saddle soap. And saddle soap the bag maybe once a week to prevent the dry rot from the sun and the weather conditions from ruining the leather. Now we said striking, but this also applies to other stand-up arts. What if you're a grappler? What if you're a wrestler? What if you're a judo practitioner, shui jiao, or MMA, where you have strikes, kicks, and throws? Another tool that you want to look at getting is a throwing dummy. A throwing dummy can help us practice, but there are a few things that you want to watch out for. Heavier is not better. The heavy throwing dummies, one, are going to cost you a ton in shipping, and they're a pain in the butt to be picking up over and over when we're trying to train. I recommend a 50 to 70 pound throwing dummy. That's gonna be ideal. It's enough weight that you'll feel off balance and you'll be able to get that kinesthetic feedback doing the throw, but not so heavy that you won't wanna pick it up repeatedly. If we get a super heavy one, they're stiff, cumbersome, and they really will prevent us from training because we'll just get sick of it and it'll either sit there and collect dust or we won't even bother. Now speaking of grapplers, the next thing on our list is what if we do grappling arts like wrestling or jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu in particular, and we want to work on the ground. Let's talk about mats first. Mats are going to be our lifeblood because we don't want a hard surface. Again, if it's too uncomfortable, we won't want to train. There are a wide variety of mats out there. If you're doing any sort of throwing and takedowns, you want a mat that's thick enough to be able to handle that. If you're doing super hard throws, like things like hip tosses and high, high tosses, things that flip somebody upside down and slam, you don't want a crash mat. Those are six to eight inches thick and they can displace those forces and keep our partners uh, safe. The thing with the crash mat to watch for is make sure you get something big enough, like a four by eight. If you get anything smaller, it's easy to miss the mat and land on the floor instead. Right, Ryan? So we want to make sure that we keep hitting the mat and that'll give you enough space without taking up too much room because they do fold in half into a four by four so it's easy to slide off to the side. That's a big factor when we talk about mats that we're going to train on in general is how much space they take up. I recommend a good quality mat. I know they're expensive, they cost a little bit more money, but in the long run you will benefit greatly from it and you'll enjoy your investment. Remember, if you're a martial artist and this is your thing, that's a future investment that you're gonna get a lot of use out of. Just like if you have bought equipment for some other sport. It's not something that's gonna get ruined or torn up, so you'll be able to use it for years to come. I'll get into some of the cheap options in a second and tell you why I don't like them, but for now, when we talk about mats, what I like and what I use is what's called a flexi roll system. 
on the bottom of the mat every six inches there's a slit so when we're done training we can roll it up super tight it can fit in a closet and it's out of the way if we don't have a space to leave the mats out something like that is crucial it will help us a lot especially convincing our living mates that this is a uh, something that we can have in the house if you do have a permanent spot and that's less important still recommend the flexi roll just because you may have to move that to another location at some point and it's easy to fit in a car and transport the thickness of the mat does matter for anything that you're doing takedowns or any sort of throw that's not the heavy throws we talked about you want like an inch and a half to two inch thickness too thick and it gets spongy and it becomes more of that crash mat material so we want that right thickness that's dense enough to stop us from hitting the floor underneath but it's enough to cushion the fall another option for us is puzzle mats now i absolutely hate puzzle mats myself and i know a few of my students have tried them at home and they've also ended up not liking them don't recommend them because putting them together and taking them apart, if you do have a temporary training space, it's a pain in the butt and you won't want to get them out. So again, you may have saved some money on the mat system that you decided to get. But in the long run, if we're not training, then what good was that money spent? The other problem with puzzle mats is the cheaper ones, because they can get expensive. The cheaper ones are slippery on the top surface and they're not very comfortable. So you're looking at probably about three quarter to one inch thick on those puzzle mats, the stuff that you can get at the box stores. And it's not really thick enough to be comfortable to be rolling on or doing any sort of grappling. Which leads to my last option that I do recommend is build your own. If the other mats are too expensive, there's a few options. One of my students had a great suggestion of stacking carpet pads together and then taking vinyl and wrapping it around using glue gun underneath to attach it. That, I haven't tried that personally, but that's a good suggestion. And you can also use some foam if you can buy some on the internet, get a thicker foam, higher density, and a piece of vinyl, and you can do the same thing with the foam system. You can find videos online of how to make homemade training mats. I'm sure there are plenty of them out there. But that's an option I would definitely consider. The next tool that we want to look for for training on the ground are grappling dummies. These can be very helpful. Again, we don't want something that's uncomfortable and hard to use. There are two types. The type that we use a lot don't have any limbs on them. They're just bags that have contoured shapes. And they're great for hip escapes, north-south transitions, ground and pound, knees and elbows. Most of the stuff that we do, we can do six positions, side control. The part that can be beneficial if your grappling dummy has limbs is you can work on things like submissions, like arm bars, maybe Americanas if it's limber enough. Making your own grappling dummy, some people do it. It can be a pain. Uh, they're easier to buy something that's already designed for this. Again, I don't have any specific suggestions because we use the ones without the limbs. I used to have one years ago that had arms on it that stuck out like this and tore the arms off. He got a little mouthy one day, so arm bar. All right, and the last one that we're going to cover today is strength and conditioning. Now, as martial artists, fighters, boxers, grapplers, this is crucial. So how do we keep our strength and conditioning up at home? First tool we want to get, hands down, jump rope. Jump rope, it's been used in boxing for probably 100 years or more for a reason. It's great for cardio and conditioning. Especially if you don't have a place to go running, you don't have a bicycle, you, you can't jog, you can't do jumping jacks, go outside and get a jump rope. Work yourself up to being able to jump rope for five minutes and you'll see 
one, how difficult that is, and two, how much, it's, how much benefit it is to your conditioning. For strength training, there are a ton of body weight exercises that we can focus on. If you don't have any room to store weights, push-ups, burpees, squat thrusts, squats in general, there are a ton of body weight exercises out there that we can still get fit. Most of the training that we, that we do here for strength and conditioning involves body weight exercises. If you have a place that you can do pull-ups, that's great. If you do have room for weights, I recommend dumbbells, kettlebells, medicine balls. There's a variety of exercises we can do with those, but you want to train properly, train smart. So if you haven't worked with those tools before, try to educate yourself as much as possible on how to do it right. Even if you, right now you can't have a coach there to help you, it's worth the time that you spend learning and trying to work it out so that you don't injure yourself because it's easy to do once we start slinging weights around. There you go. There are some tips for you on how to maximize and train and build your own training center at home. I wanna hear from all of you if you have ways that you train at home that you think uh, are neat, innovative, good ideas that you can share with everyone so we can all benefit. Questions, comments, leave them down below. Happy to give suggestions. Till next time.